Uh, now, okay, let's get to today's uh, topic. Uh, where is Adam Smith? I'm sorry, I missed uh, that. Uh, <laughs> uh, for all of you and most other scholars, it may seem a stupid question, but uh, if we place this scholar and his theory of economics into the history of the economic development of Min and Qin China and make a comparison with Europe in the same period, then its meaning is extraordinary. It is no exaggeration to say that in the eyes of many Chinese historians, the question as to <coughs> Uh, whether or not Smith is in China constitutes the whole history of Chinese economic development and its rural society, which is related to the past, present, and future of the Chinese economy and the environment. What I do is trying to place on this Smith question the green hat, that is, uh, to adapt it to the environmental or ecological history that forming a new understanding of Smith's theory and of the Chinese economy. From the Western perspective, China was the ideal country in the eyes of the European Enlightenment thinkers of the 17th century. So, becoming a rich but stagnant country in the East, and over time, the sick man of Asia, or the land of famine, suddenly, Especially after 1949, China awoke and then becoming in many people's eyes a huge threat to the world. These descriptive terms have some truth if we put each of them in the chronological order and link them to their corresponding periods. But if we focus them on the same fragment of history, that is, the Ming and Qin dynasties, that I want to discuss today, on two surprise, how would the old China, which has long been seen as a backward, stagnant, impoverished, declining country, unexpectedly become a democratic, free, wealthy, powerful, and even environment-friendly society, and a great empire just like the Western empires of the same era? Today, it is impossible for me to cover everything in this talk. What I can do is explore one aspect. Uh, aspect. In this talk, the Chinese economy, in order to uh, situate this change within our historical understanding of China and to consider what can be learned from this process. At first, I would like to show you the distorted image of Adam Smith. <coughs> at first, let me look at how Adam Smith himself observed the contemporary China according to his theory of the division of labor. Uh, first, uh, we, we talk, what is Adam Smith's theory of division of labor? In Smith's uh, view, the human natural tendency for exchange is the basic driving force of the division of labor, which itself is the main force promoting growth of productivity and national wealth. Consequently, human society involves from hunting, gathering, and agriculture to business. Although this is a common future among all humans, the formation and expansion of the market, which determines the range of the division of labor, develops initially near great waterways and slowly expanding inland. <coughs> The industrial structure of a country involves, uh, that means naturally, through a sequence of agriculture, industry, and foreign trade, but taking a different path according to its own conditions. Europe is taking an unnatural, 
and uh, retrograde path of economic development, while China is caught halfway through its natural course, which neither regresses nor moves forward. Adam Smith displays for us the diversity of the growth of global economies and human wealth. Yeah. But why China is so different? Uh, on the, uh, according to uh, Smith, on the one hand, it has been long one of the richest, most fertile, best cultivated, most industrious, and most popular countries in the world, and richer than European countries. On the other hand, it appears to have been stationary since the description of Marco Polo more than 500 years earlier, and Smith claimed the poverty of the lower ranks of people in China far surpasses that of the most begging nations in Europe. Why would wealth and stagnation coexisted in China? Firstly, China's policy favored agriculture and had little respect for foreign trade, which had the propensity to increase its manufacturers and the skill set of the Chinese people. Secondly, China's political and legal system limited the growth of social wealth. Smith investigated the relationship between population wealth growth and increases in neighbor compensation, dividing countries into four types of economic development. The no gain, no loss of China, a gradual increase in Europe, the rapid decline of India, and the rapid growth of the North American. He did imply the proportion of population to resources to be an important factor. Oh, sorry. <coughs> now uh, we, we uh, uh, from the uh, Smith to the um, 1999, there is a lot of uh, scholars talk about uh, China, but now I have to uh, missed. I just uh, go directly to the California school. Uh, this school uh, is very powerful in the um, Chinese uh, China studies in the USA in the China. Many many people, uh, especially young scholars, now the California school. <coughs> This, uh, in, uh, this school in, uh, initiated by Professor R. B. Wang has gradually moved studies of the 18th century China away from Western or Eurocentric interpretations. Based on Wang's research, Kunnes Pomeranz placed both China and England into the world economic system so that these two entities become agents that interact and connect with negative agents. He also takes the income passing comparison proposed by Charles Tinney to look at the global conjunctures. The most the most important recent contribution to our understanding of Chinese rural development comes from Giovanni uh, Argy's Adam Smith in Beijing. His reinterpretation of Smith's theory of the division of labor basically restores its original appearance. Smith's division of labor is not inside the same production unit, but between different production units and social strata, namely the social division of neighbor. In recent decades, prayers have been more common towards 18th century China. Smith was no longer a symbol of the industrialization, mechanization, and urbanization of modern Europe, but an observer living in the agricultural society, bound by resource limits, environmental constraints, and ecological impasse. impasse. <coughs> the California School has claimed it was Smith England 
that couldn't extricate itself from an ecological dead end. In the interpretation of the Arbing War and Pomeranz, Smith was a country bumpkin with the special favor for the countryside. But in the eyes of the Irish, it's not only so, but also this bumpkin who is the key secret of the East Asian, especially China, Renaissance. However, the expansion of this perspective have not formed a, a clearer understanding of history. Through the historiographical progress described above, we can see how Smith's relevance for China has changed in his lifetime. He was merely a distant observer of China, yet his legacy was to encourage comparison between Europe and China, albeit often to the discredit of NATO. But finally, he has been living in China and got a good reputation. Uh, next, uh, where we talk, uh, is Adam Smith was not in China. <coughs> I will now further clarify Smith's definition of division of labor to shake the discussion of Pomeran and RG so as to highlight the misunderstanding of Smith and thus of China. Firstly, Smith didn't, as RG said, bring his readers at first into the PIM factory and then turn to the social division of labor outside factory. Rather, he stated that it is impossible to collect every every different branch of the work and such a large number of workmen into the same workhouse where the division becomes more obvious and more easy to observe. Therefore, the pin factory is only as example and Smith has never named the owner of the social division of labor. Uh, furthermore, according to Smith's discussion, such a division mainly refers to the division of labor among independent producers, such as between agriculture and industry, urban and country, international labor, manual and mental labor, and accordingly between the producers and managers and the rulers and the ruled, or the distinction between state and society. Such a division of labor doesn't just apply to pre-industrial or agrarian society and was viewed by Smith as a driving force behind the mechanical inventions that simplified and reduced labor. Indeed, he stated that the invention of all those machines include the what the steam engine, the steam engine. <coughs> by which labor is so much facilitated and abridged seem to have been originally owing to the division of labor. Certainly, Smith <coughs> also separated technological innovation from technological application and foresaw a newer social division of labor in the emergence of a specialized class of scientists. Fourth, Smith expressed the preference for the country, but was not a country bumpkin, as they did by Arge. According to Michael Pierman, he is a professor of uh, California University, <coughs> this car, <coughs> he made clear that farming, uh, Smith made clear that farming was not better than trade and industry, and stressed rural development in England to be a product of urban improvement. <coughs> Finally, why was the coal mine, which is seen by Pomeranz as a resource needed to break through the energy bottleneck in the England, discussed very little in Smith's book? In this regard, I argue that the term division of labor was created by Smith, but 
The discussion of this issue is allowed only Smithen one, but of a Scottish score that extended past his time. By the way, um, Smith uh, came from Scottish, but he is a fan of Great Britain. He now <laughs> Great Britain. <coughs> <laughs> that it turned, <clears throat> the story told uh, by the, the others have here can be seen as a sequel to the story of Smith. In short, <clears throat> uh, what Smith outlined in Wealth of Nations was a global economic system dominated by Great Britain. Based on the separation of agriculture and industry, workers and peasants, and centered on the division between rural and urban in the pursuit of the expansion of domestic and international markets. The California school doesn't completely exclude the connotation of Smith's neighbor division, but doesn't elaborate. So, misunderstanding Chinese and European society. Next, uh, we'll talk about Pomerantz. <coughs> However, Pomerantz's description of overseas colonies and armed trade rule in European energy use shows the more delicate, clear historical scene of the expanding international division of labor that Smith criticized but could be give up. He also showed how the international division of labor was constructed and its impact on Britain. At the core of the system, with tentacles extending into various regions, it didn't only use local materials or adjust measures to local conditions, but more often reconstructed on a large scale the people, land, capital and the entire ecosystem in fringe areas according to the needs of the core area and so constitute different but complementary relationship to the core area for the supply and demand of commodities. <coughs> By contrast, what does Pomeran tell us about 18th century China? He argues that it not just like England. The nation had not only had its own core area such as Jiangnan, Ninnan, but marginal areas and international trade with Southeast Asia. What was the result? In Southeast Asia, one of the core areas, Ninnan, had no ability or plan to transform their ecosystems in terms of relations with the North China, Jiangnan gradually lost its comparative advantage due to the emerging breakthrough of textile technologies and imports in the not, 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 uh, uh, in the late 17th century, Han Chinese colonization in frontier and minority areas meant expansion of agriculture areas rather than reconstruction of new special economic zones, which were different from but complementary to the core areas. The rational government policy focus remained one of encouraging agriculture rather than the commerce, and the foreign trade was still restric restricted. <coughs> if China and England were facing the same ecological crisis, why did China not pursue foreign imperialism as the West did? Pomeran revealed the difference between the name. If we put these districts under the framework of one China, what we see is a close, self-exploited, outer large-scale human ecological system. At the family level, China adopted the typical self-exploited system of labor use. In terms of the gender relations, it was a system 
in which male operates female. In terms of the interaction between the central plain and the minority areas, it was a process of Chinese cultural assimilation. In terms of the relationship between human and nature across China, this was an unprecedented squeeze on the ecosystem on the largest scale in human history. This strategy uh, uh, this, uh, this strategy had a temporary effect but brought serious ecological crisis. Pomeran cited the so-called European monsoon in 19th century in order to show serious damage to the environment caused by deforest, uh, deforestation. But in China, it was not just the environment that was in crisis, but people a crisis of human survival. The Pomeran looks at 19th century China as a period of extreme disaster is correct. But what, what about the 18th and 17th centuries? It's hardly convincing to equate China with Europe, especially England. Studies indicate that uh, so society could Persists in China just because population damage resulting from large scale war and famine. In China, the ecological impasse was broken through this cruel self regulation rather than being eased through external expansion. This seemed to be the norm in Chinese history. Its continuity was based on discontinuity of periodical survival crisis. Next, <clears throat> once we connect the two inside and outside production into a system of labor division and place them in a longer historical period, a more vivid, real, magnificent image of the formation and diffusion of modern ecosystems appears. This is a work what Professor Jason Moore, a promising American scholar, has been engaged in for the last decades. Written in terms of the separation between urban and rural in the human and nature energy conversation process, he saved the focus from early in from industrial evolution to the formation of modern capitalism and investigates the old and the new world as a whole center on England. As a result, the two wonderfuls in the eyes of Pomeranz, namely coal mines and colonies, become two different types of ecological frontiers of capital accumulation. One type of frontier involving colonies moves horizontally and the other involving core moving vertically. Hence, in the world system or world ecology, most favorite term, the various ecological factors summoned up and separated by Pomeranz are mobilized one by one into a single creative destruction process of capital accumulations in different historical periods. <coughs> so this press sport a giant tidal whirlpool of industrialization and urbanization, forming successive ecological crises that sweep regionally and globally. With this process, butterfly winds, the palm brands um, I mentioned, such uh, coal mines and colonies could have unexpected effects. But regrettably, regrettably Jason Moore is influenced by the California school, and so Smithian dynamics remain in 18th century China. <coughs> this is a um, last piece. <coughs> uh, my question is, how can we view the dynamics of economic evolution in China since the Ming Dynasty? If the Smithian dynamic doesn't explain it, then what does? Does the Smithian dynamic have no impact on China? If so, 
Since when and to what extent? How is this associated with environment change in Chinese history? What kind of impact will this have on the ecological system of China and on the world in the future? First, I will talk about uh, the alternative thinking of Chinese past. Uh, on this issue, Chinese scholars <coughs> have an alternative to offer. Think through the idea community envisaged, envisaged by Mengshus around uh, 2,300 years ago. There is no difference between the family economy and uh, the mode of production envisaged by Mengshus. In Chinese academia, there are various definitions of such a market. I prefer to use the term market without a social division of neighbor, and just relatively speaking, <coughs> which means that at the micro level, this combines agriculture and uh, handicrafts and is based on division of neighbor within the family. At the micro level, it is manifested by the geographical division of neighbor based on difference of natural resources, environment, and ge geographical environment. Uh, that means long distance trade and, and uh, symmetrical you need directional exchange based on movement from of rent, taxi, or other sub-economic exploitation from rural to the urban settings. <coughs> As a basic form of Chinese traditional market, according to the Mark Elvin, as a pioneer of the environmental history of China, uh, of China, China environmental history. China. Outside, yes. It kept developing on its own way and from the 8th to 14th century created a major economic revolution which brought China even closer to the threshold of industrialization. During the Ming and Qing dynasties, in response to the massive growth of China's population, this kind of market continued to expand alone and function flawlessly. But because resource prices continue to climb, labor costs being extremely cheap, this country finally lost momentum to move forward in technological innovation and the transformation of business organizations and entered into a technology knocking dynamo or the state of the technical dormant. Everything is fine, but it does work. And then, in the 1840s, was defeated in a collision with another completely different economic structures or ecosystems. Before uh, 1840, in Chinese society, many officials and uh, academics and even emperors deeply worried about the environmental and survival crisis. Finally, in the Qianlong reign, the government tried to solve the, this crisis by encouraging people to reclaim hills, snakes, forest, grasses, forests, and so on, as soon as they could. As a result, during the late 18th century and early 19th century, those who experienced and witnessed the explosive growth of population and environmental deterioration couldn't find any effective way than population control, a mouth solution. It was at this time that the theory of Adam Smith was introduced by Western missionaries and began to spread among Chinese officials and scholars, many of whom is it as the holy road to rescue Chinese people. Is that guy? <laughs> this guy is uh, William Alexander Parsons Madin. It's a too long name. <coughs> Uh, he was uh, as a general teacher, a professor, 
in the official school uh, created by the Qin Dynasty. And the, one of the courses is about uh, political economy. In Chinese, is Fu Guo Ce, to make nation wealth. Uh, wealth, the po um, policy to make the nation wealth, Fu Guo Ce. But this uh, Fu Guo Ce just from <coughs> this guy is Henry Fawcett. Uh, Henry Fawcett. That, that <coughs> he asked uh, some Chinese scholars translate this book into this. Uh, this yes. In this book, there's not all about Adam Smith's thoughts. <coughs> this guy is a very famous reformist uh, thinker of in China. Uh, in China. He thinks that translation is very terrible. So he retranslated into Chinese. And uh, the name of uh, uh, the retranslation of Fu uh, Guo Ce, Fu Guo Ce, and he didn't uh, tell the difference between Fawcett and uh, Adam Smith. He mistook this guy for the Adam Smith and de decided to write a new book. <coughs> to provide the guidance to Chinese people. That's the sequel to the Wealth of Nation, this book. The sequel to the Wealth of Nation. So the, <coughs> it's very interesting uh, in, uh, how the Adam Smith uh, came to uh, China, uh, came to China. <coughs> uh, after uh, the... Uh, Anti the Sino Japanese War in 1918, uh, 1895. Yan Fu is a, is a very famous, is the most famous, one of the most famous reformists, maybe the uh, trade uh, liberal, uh, liberalism is Yan Fu. He translated the whole book of Adam Smith into Chinese into Chinese. <coughs> and uh, in 1931, another guy, that's the uh, Marxist economist uh, Wang Yalan and his uh, friends Guo Dali translated again into the Chinese. This is uh, maybe the most accurate translation of Smith's work. That's the Smith how to into uh, China, in China. <coughs> but uh, because China was confronted by the deadly menace of international colonialism at that time, economic or trade liberalism came under criticism by other scholars. Later, Marxism began to gradually spread in China and after 1949, occupied a dominant position in the minds of Chinese thinkers. Smith's influence substituted <coughs> even further and was considered only supplementary to the study of Marx, uh, Marxist theory. Smith's economic liberalism seemed to be incompatible with a mainstream ideology, but the essence of Smith's theory that the social dividend of labor was not abandoned. After the reform and opening up to the West, with the translation from the planet economy to market economy and the establishment of the market economy system, Smith's theory was replaced Marxism and truly become the Bible of economies in China. <coughs> uh, I I think I have uh, run, uh, run uh, out, uh, out of my time. Maybe I will just show you the one point. So <laughs> now this I want to talk 
uh, the uh, practice of Adam Smith part and is this <coughs> it's clear from the back okay Too quick. It's too quick. <laughs> too quick. <laughs> this. Uh, that's all the way on to uh, in in the uh, internal uh, internal colonization internal uh, internal colonization <clears throat> uh, maybe a self colonization. <clears throat> That I want to show you some picture. Uh, this is, is uh, just from the Jiangxi province, uh, Yihuang County of official says, no demolish, no new China. <laughs> that ha just happened in um, 2010s. <coughs> this is another uh, picture in China, the Chinese character of the demolish is te, this, uh, uh, in the circle, in the circle, te, te, so in China pronounce it te, te, China. <coughs> uh, it's very similar, I was pronunciation. <coughs> and this I want to, <coughs> this is megas of Mao. And uh, now transformed into the tall building. <coughs> and this another uh, picture is from. <coughs> so I want to uh, go to the in <coughs> conclusion. <coughs> Until now, a Smith has transformed into numerous Smith who are both friends and uh, opponents. Their conjuncture has had a huge impact on China and the world. What kind of storm will it brew in the future? Is it the Anthropocene, Ecozoic, or the post-human era? The anti-Smith school of thought has acquired a different kind of meaning, but we must realize that while industrialization, globalization, and expanding social division of neighbor have certainly brought great environmental disasters, the one, at least the 1,000 years history of China tell us that expansion of the low-level school division of labor also insulted in a great ecological crisis, although limited just in China. <coughs> we also <coughs> can be satisfied with discussing Smith's impact on the environment. We need to know where the division of neighbor comes from, from, why there exists a different strategy of division, and the relation between environmental change and orange and expansion of labor division. Smith's explanation focuses on the natural human tendency to exchange, but in an alternative situation, what transportation was regarded as the starting point for the formation and expansion of market. This reminds us not to ignore the relationship between human and uh, non-human nature. Just like Peter Dixon, I also wonder whether those people who are living in this time of great division of neighbor have been alienated from nature by the increased intricate web of the neighbor divisions. Can we overcome this impairment of the environmental understanding and thus reconstruct or return to nature? Perhaps this is a cognitive cause we have to pay, just as we have to pay physiological, psychological, transaction, environmental, social, and political costs. Would the total ecological cost be all of these combined? That I want to ask that question. 
finally, I want to show my hometown um, Christoph just uh, mentioned. <coughs> How to... <coughs> oh, sorry. My hometown just located uh, very near the neck, uh, Tohu. This is a river mouth. <coughs> oh, sorry. <coughs> you can see the three generations, the house of three generations. One is um, a cottage, just a cottage. Um, when I uh, was a, a child, 30, 40 years ago, and uh, the second generation of the house is a wafa. <laughs> I have to, a brick, yes, yes. It will be the second generation. About uh, built, uh, of, uh, generally built uh, about uh, 1980s to 1990s. The third generation house is that. Just like the villa. Just like the villa, yes. <coughs> Since 1999, I left my hometown and never back before I took the video. Yeah. <coughs> My brother said, if, you, if we walk, we will take um, more than 10 minutes. But uh, if now we just uh, take a boat, so just two minutes. <coughs> That's uh, my uh, hometown. Uh, it's very beautiful on the surface. But the water, look at it clean, but water is full of fu uh, yin yang, what have to say? Uh, eutrophia. The word is, is lots of what higher is uh, water vegetables. And uh, uh, the terribly, uh, terrible, uh, the most terrible thing is you see that the bridge. Th that bridge is just uh, under construction. Because uh, the government of Anhui province, especially the Hefei city, is the capital of the Anhui province, try uh, have uh, include the Tohu Lake into the uh, who, in the Hefei city and want to rebuild the whole neck. So they want to uh, change my hometown into the uh, tourist uh, places. So they, they, they have plan to divide my hometown, just uh, build a canal. So uh, the house I lived will go down, 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 down to the riverbed. That's what happened and will be happened in my home village. So I uh, told uh, Christoph, I want to back to my hometown, but my hometown will be 
die before I die. That I want to tell you. That uh, that's okay. Sorry, I take too much uh, of your your time. <clears throat> Thanks a lot of you. Thank you.